Um, I can knock this part out really quick or I can make it really slow. Uh, I even have races in my class where I'll give all the kids the exact same part um, and try to find out who can do it the fastest. Um, I have even had kids that did job interviews that that was the job interview. The kids were given a part um, they were not necessarily told why, but they were given the part and they were asked to do the part. And one of the things um, that that employer was looking for was how fast they were able to produce the part. And if you're able to produce it fairly fast, um, then I know that you're going to use your time wisely and you're going to be able to make me money quicker. Um, you know, if I give you a part and you struggle with it and you're going through it at a kind of a um, struggled pace or a roundabout way of being able to do it, then that also tells me a lot of things. So a big portion of what I push the kids is a little bit of speed um, and trying to interpret the part before I ever attack it. And you've got kids that will look at this and they'll just be overwhelmed. They don't have any place to start. They don't know where I'm going to try to attack it at. And you kind of want to give them the opportunity to start getting their own strategies. So every time I show them something, I'll do it purposely a different way. Um, I'll do it maybe the way I would do it or I will do it the way that I think they might want to do it but I will do different things all the time just to use different tools and just to show them applications for them so I'm just going to kind of knock out a couple of these pieces just to give you a concept of how how I would do some of these in industry um, so if I'm looking at a quick way to be able to do it um, X, Y plane, all of those things. You'll find out later on when we start using edge cam and some of those things that there are specific planes where I should be drawing. But right now, I'm going to try to draw it in the exact same plane that I see there. And really, you want these kids to get in the mindset of milling. If this is going to be milling, then I want to try to use a subtractive method in one way or another. So if I know that it's five and one eighth of an inch tall, I know that it's one and three quarters of an inch tall are wide then I'm going to draw it up as one big solid. When finished sketch, I extrude it my 2.75. The biggest reason I really want that is eventually it's going to ask me some questions about, well, what was the material lost? Well, I have it as a solid right here. If this is the solid, I can come into my eye properties. I can go to my physical tab. This thing is made out of mild steel. So I'm going to come to my steels, mild steel. This will give me all of my properties for it. So now that I have all these properties, it's telling me what it was as a solid. And once I get my dimensions completely done, I can just subtract those two from each other. So you do want for this specific activity for the kids to kind of think of this more as a subtractive method rather than the additive method. But really the majority of this part is done. Um, I can go ahead and put the sketch on the top of it. I'm going to go ahead and put that groove that's in there. Um, it tells you that the groove is 5 eighths of an inch wide and it's going to be 3 quarters of an inch deep. To get it centered, that's where a lot of the kids get trouble. They're like, well, there is no dimension. It doesn't tell me those kind of things. And they have to start learning how to assume when dimensions are not given that that means that it's going to be in the middle. Otherwise, they're going to have some different surface areas and some of those things are not going to match up with the numbers they're looking for. So they try to figure out, how am I going to get this box centered up and down? And one little quick trick that you can teach them is it has to do with the horizontal and vertical tool. I use these a lot for trying to center things. If I click on the horizontal and I say, I want the middle of this line to always be horizontal to the middle of this line, then it will lock those two together. No matter what happens to the part. If I ever go back in and I change that two and three quarters to something different, then this five eighths of an inch will recenter itself. Okay, so that's that's the little things that I want the kids to start trying to think about um, is a lot about editability. Um, customers a lot of times they think they know what they want um, and then they pretty easily come back later and like, oh, that's not exactly what I thought it was going to look like. I'd like you to go in and make this change. All right, so if I got to go in and make a change to however tall that is or however wide it is, I'm going to change this to you know, five inches wide, that groove is still going to be in the middle no matter what. So if that was something that was important to the part, then I'll do that. Really, I'm done and Inventure will do everything else because it's at a chamfer. And that's why they put that on there was to give the kids a hint. Yeah, I can do sketches. I could draw triangles on both ends. I could cut those off. I could do triangles on this end and cut those off. Or I can just come in here and chamfer them at a 45 degree. 
Here's where they do have to do a little bit of math. Unfortunately, this is not what a manufacturer would want. I could honestly care less that this is three quarters of an inch at the bottom. If I'm going to go over to the milling machine, I need to know how much to take off, not necessarily how much to leave. But regardless, either way, um, if I know that this is one inch, oops, this is three quarters of an inch, the short side is going to be three quarters of an inch. I come in here and I chamfer the other side, oops, at one inch. That will take care of the entire part for me. So you want them to have their own way. You also want them to try to think of a strategy before they ever start. So before I ever tackle this part, I already knew in my mind I was going to make it up as a solid, I was going to put the groove in it, and then I was going to chamfer these edges. And some kids just have a really hard time with that. They'll get themselves into a bind, and then they'll add a cut onto a cut. And instead of editing things, they'll just try to make another sketch. And they'll do sketches on top of angled planes. And you just got to slow them down sometimes in the very beginning to get a strategy before they ever start. So any questions about this piece? I know that's fast, but I want you to see that these pieces should be fairly fast. Okay. I think I think mine, uh, my group, some of them used the chamfer and some of them went and were more familiar with uh, trigonometry and, and uh, algebra 2 and they went in and realized it was a 45, 45, 90 triangle and calculated some dimensions. Later on you're going to use a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So yeah, some of them pulled from their math knowledge to help them out. And I, yeah, I, and I can, like I said, I can come in here. Um, and I can show the kids this, and I can even time it as far as how long it's going to take me to be able to do. So if I know that's 0.75, which I know since the entire thing is one and three quarters, um, it's going to make that an inch. That's a 45 degree. I can go ahead and cut that off of the end. That gives me one. Then you get kids that are going to go ahead and do the exact same thing down here on the other end, but that's still... It's not a waste of their time, it's just time consuming. Really what you want them to start doing is looking at these tools and trying to find tools that will do the hard part for them. So even if I was going to do this, I would not waste my time redoing that entire thing down at the other end. I'm going to make Inventor do it. The power of Inventor is allowing it to do all the 3D things. So the feature that I use most often is this mid-plane between two parallels. Um, we focus a lot of this in IED when I want things to be duplicated on both ends. If I use this plane, I can click on one parallel and the second parallel, and it's easy. There's nothing else over here for me to pick, so it's fairly easy for me to grab this right through the part, and it puts a plane for me right in the middle. Now that I have a plane in the middle, I can grab that last extrusion, and I can send it over here to the other end. And I'll take care of that for me. So now I can do the same thing. I can make a sketch here. I can make one cut. I can send that over to the other side with a plane that takes care of me this way. I use that a lot when it comes down to um, some of the pieces like, like this. Rather than do a lot of this just on one end, I just do one end and I tell Inventor to send it down to the other end. So you, you kind of have to start pausing a little bit in the beginning um, and trying to get that philosophy on how I'm going to get it built before I get myself into a bind where I've just made it a lot more complicated on myself than it needed to be. Can now, you do that again on the, on the duplicating? Sure. So let me go ahead and do the 45s this way. So if I go ahead and do my new sketch here, let's, I don't remember the dimensions. So here's the other bad part. Okay, so the kids have, put back in ISO, the kids have already cut this. If the kids have already cut it, when they go to do a new sketch down here, once they've got this new sketch, really there is no geometry here for them to click on. This is back in behind there. Um, some kids know how to use project geometry, but there's really nothing for me to grab this small 45. I have nothing to really click on here. It looks like I've got it in the right place, but it's just an optical illusion. I've just kind of drawn it out there somewhere. And Venner is telling me right now, at the very bottom of my screen, it's telling me that it needs four dimensions. Okay, there's kids that will be like, oh, that's good enough. 
good enough is not exactly what we're looking. These need to be exact. When they give you your numbers for your surface area, for your mass, for your volume, they should be identical. Every single student should be identical. So the other option that I have, and I can project geometry. If I project that geometry, it's going to bring it to me. So now I can use it. The other option is to not make those 45s yet. Don't send it down to this end. Since I've not sent it down to this end, I can go ahead and do a sketch on a big flat face. I can go ahead and put on my 45 degree line. And even the kids don't know, they know this distance. They can figure out that's going to be 0.75. And they can do an angular dimension on it. That's going to be at 45 degrees. Or they could have just done 0 0.75, 0 0.75, however they want. And then they could just cut all and now I could do a bunch of mirroring. So now that I have that plane on there, I could go ahead and mirror the original, oops, the original cut down to this end. And I put on that other mid plane. This is the one I, I, I don't even know why all these exist. Really I need the first one and I need this mid plane. I really don't use any of the others. They're all the same thing. You can an offset work plane. I just click plane and I just grab a surface and pull it off. That is an offset work plane. There really needs to be no icon specifically for that. It does the exact same thing. So it really is out of this great big list of stuff, you need the first one and you need the fourth one. Everything else is really just duplicates. If I want a tangent, this first one will do a tangent. I'm not quite sure why they've done that, but they have. So oops. So if I do a mid plane from front to back. I can now mirror this little guy over the other side and take care of that. The same thing. I've got the exact same answer. It's going to give me the same answer when it comes to the properties, but I really haven't saved myself anything if I understand what chamfers truly do. Um, so if I look at like this piece here, and when we did them on the website, I did them in some fairly simple terms. Um, just because I've got some kids that have never touched Inventor before. So if they're watching my videos most of the time, I won't necessarily do it the fastest way. Sometimes it'll be a really slow way using very easy tools. And again, that's just sometimes for the kids. So same thing if I'm grabbing this one. Um, you kind of have to decide how you're going to do it. Again, I probably would do it just as one big solid chunk. That way I can answer that one question that says, what was the difference from when it was a solid block to when it is now? But it's not that hard. Most of my kids are fairly bright that they can just take three times one and a half times five and they've got the volume for what that block was. But some kids catch on to that kind of stuff quick. Um, I have found most recently my students are really bad with story problems. Um, and that's becoming evident that Indiana kids are becoming less capable of being able to do story problems. So that's one of the big focuses that they have right now on a lot of the tests that they're doing is being able to take these. So these are really good problems for the kids to go through and think about life scenarios on how much is it going to cost, even if they're going to ship something on UPS. You know, okay, so if I take these two things out of the box, these are my big heavy things and I can ship it for a lot less. You know, if it fits, it ships, that kind of stuff. They really don't think that that's that big a deal. It is a pretty big deal. So I can come in here and, and lock that on. Um, they've told me that they're half inches on both sides, so I don't care what it is in the middle. I just know that it's a half inch here. I know that it's a half inch here. Um, I know that it's three quarters of an inch down. And I can cut all. Now that I've got that in done, I would do chamfers on these tops. That's when you get, finally get the opportunity for the kids to do a chamfer that has an angle with it, because it's not just a 45 degree. So it's, since this is such a visual software, rather than the kids doing a whole lot of guessing, it's usually easiest if they just go ahead and pick the face that they want to set it off of. Get out of my way. Pick the edge that they want to go off of. And then as they start typing in these numbers, it will start making a little bit more sense to them. So if I want this to be 30 degrees, and I want a distance of, where is it at? Okay. 
What am I missing here? Oh, 0.75 down. Something's not right. Did that make that right? Ooh. Something's not right. I must not have made that right. Point seven five down. Mm. You have to check the other side. Are you safe? Hmm. I don't know. It's all the long way. And then in here we'll tell that this is 0.75 down and it's 30 degrees. That's a great lesson to learn too because the, the kids, you have to tell them, look, you're an engineer, you're a problem solver. If something doesn't work, don't do it that way. Do it a different way. Um, otherwise, you'll be running around like a chicken with your head cut off answering questions all day long. Just Say, hey, if it doesn't work, try something else. And you really want them to be that kind of problem solver. Um, you want them to be able to say, I have a whole bag of tricks. Now, today this tool works, and tomorrow, for whatever reason, this tool doesn't work. So they have to be able to figure that out. Now, the really, really big thing that's powerful about Inventor, Inventor is also a calculator. So unfortunately, what I want to know right now is I want to know how tall that little piece is down there. Same thing, if I'm going to manufacture this, I'm going to machine this off, I'd like to know how much I'm taking off. So I can ask Inventor to do it for me. I can say 1.5, subtract 0.75, subtract an additional 0.5, and it'll tell me whatever it is. So if it's a quarter of an inch, then it's a quarter of an inch. You know, I tell the kids it's not necessarily because I couldn't do the math in my head. The nice part is I leave it as a formula so that half the time I can come back in here, I can see where the number came from. Rather than just say 0.25, and 0.25 is nowhere on the sheet, I might not remember eventually where I ever got that dimension from. So I do leave things out in formulas so that I can remember how I got that answer later on. So once I have it, I go ahead and extrude that. And since I'm symmetrical, I'm the same on both ends, I'll use that same midplane and mirror both of those objects down to the other end. <coughs> Go ahead and poke a hole in the middle. Some kids that are in geometry know about bisecting objects. If I come across here, draw a line across, now I have found the center. So that's supposed to be one inch. I go ahead and extrude that as one inch. But I can use that exact same trick I showed you a second ago. That I can just go ahead and draw a circle that's one inch and I can lock on the horizontals. So lock the center of that to the center of that. And I can lock the center of this to the center of this, and it'll do the exact same thing when I don't have that geometry that's sitting there. The other option, and I teach the kids this a lot, and this really comes back from my old drafting days. If I am going to do a bisector like this, the problem with it, and you saw it just kind of a second ago, the problem is when I go to extrude this, Inventor likes to find these two triangles. When I've got my circle on here, I want it, and I'm still going to extrude it. Sometimes it wants to flip around, and sometimes it doesn't want to find my circle. You can hide this from the 3D features and keep it just in 2D. If I grab this line and I come all the way up here, I have the option to change its formatting to construction. I can also just right-click on it, and I can go to construction. If I do that and I try to extrude it, Inventor can't see that line anymore for features. So anytime I'm using layout lines and those types of things that I don't want to delete, but it's also causing me problems as far as what I can select and what I can't select, then I can turn it into construction lines. I can still use it for 2D geometry, and then the 3D geometry can't see it anymore. And that's great for two reasons. Number one, because we're probably all old school, and that's the way we used to do it in AutoCAD when it came on a floppy disk. And it's also good for kids to see, all right, there's another way to do it. Um, and mathematically, they use their math. All right, if I draw a line, I know the bisector, it comes up as a green dot, bam, there it is. 
So they're learning something and they think it's it's brand new. Uh, and they're they're applying their math stuff too. And that's the bad part, is most of my freshmen, um, some of them are in their geometry classes, but a lot of them are just in algebra right now. They don't they don't have the concept of some of the geometry that really was necessary when we used to take our old drafting classes on how to do center line bisectors with a compass and those types of things. They just they don't have that kind of construction method. So going through and showing them some of that helps them out a lot too. Um, this is another thing that I just want to kind of show you. This is a visual problem for the kids. Right now, I can't see this face. And if I take my mouse off of it, it disappears. If I look at it directly from the top, um, then these faces kind of disappear. I don't know why Inventor did it, but it did two years ago. It stopped showing edges. Um, they're trying to keep some clean. So you can, up in this View tab, you can have the kids change the visual style to show edges. As soon as you do that, it will outline the part with you with a black edge, which makes it a lot easier to see some things. Um, if I'm coming in here, if some of these faces, I take a look at it. Sometimes I can see lights and shadows and that kind of stuff. But if I just ask it to say shaded with edges, then all that stuff will start popping up. I can turn it off at any point in time. But most of the time while I'm drawing, I'd much rather have them on than have them off. Um, I also have kids that will ask me, they're like, I'm tired of going up there and changing this to shaded with edges. Can I just keep it on and never have to mess with it again? And yeah, you can. Um, so as a teacher, you can ask the kids to go into their tools, and you can go into the application options. That's also how my background is white. Um, when I do presentations for the kids, I love to have the white background. The problem is, and I'll show you, when I draw... Stuff that is unconstrained is black. Um, stuff that is constrained for me is dark blue. Oops. Dark blue. For them, it's much better. They have kind of a light blue color, and then they have neon green. So there's, I like the white background, but I don't like the color scheme that they have between the two different kinds of lines, things that are constrained and things that aren't constrained. Um, but I wanted to show you, I can go into my tools, my application options, and these are the two tabs that I usually mess with the most. Um, if I go to the colors tab, that's how I got my white background. I think the kids are on, I think they're on winter night gradient. Yes. I think that's, that's what their software uh -huh. comes with by default. Yep, yeah, that's default. So if I go ahead and set that up, when they go ahead and draw, like I said, theirs is going to be neon green, and their stuff that is constrained is kind of a purple color. So they get a much, much bigger difference in between them. But as I'm shining it up on the board and everything, um, I get a much better contrast with the white background. But anyway, so the other option in there, instead of going to the colors tab, let's get that back. If I go to the display tab, this is where I can turn on those edges forever. So I can come into here and I could say I would rather say shaded with edges all the time. And now when I create new files, they'll have those shaded with edges already turned on. So that's kind of up to you. If it's something that you like and you want your kids to be able to do that, mine have a really hard time, especially when it's things that are cylinders and angles and stuff like that. They just kind of disappear into the part. Um, so we'll knock this part out real quick. Oops, not open. So same thing, you have to kind of decide how, how am I going to tackle this? How am I going to do it? Some kids will make just the base plate. And if I'm going to make just the base plate, um, when I start that new standard IPT, I might as well go ahead and make it on this base, go ahead and draw it and extrude up where I've already got the chamfers and everything in there. Um, but if they're going to draw it as one big solid, then they might as well just put it on the same XY plane. Um, tells me that I'm 9 inches wide and tells me that I am 3 and a half plus a half. The problem is that you see this dimension here and don't realize whoever drew this part did a, a real industrial no-no. They left two dimensions off. You never provide a part for somebody that doesn't at least have the three overall dimensions. They gave me the nine, which is great, but the kids think that this three and a half is the overall height. They don't realize that it's three and a half plus a half. They did not provide me the overall 
um, depth either. I have to know that this is one and a half. I have to know that this is two, which is giving me another. Oh, no, they did give it to me here five. But they didn't give me the overall height. So that's some of the stuff that the kids kind of get caught up with. So three and a half plus a half. And then I can go ahead and extrude that my five inches. Really start kind of teaching the kids hot keys as well. Um, the majority of your F keys do things. Um, just kind of play, and it's not going to hurt anything. Um, your F4 brings up your orbit as long as you're holding F4. Um, F5 will give you the previous views. So every time you keep it, it'll keep cycling back through the views you've already got. Um, F6 will put it in home view and so on, but a lot of the F keys will do things. Um, so they do a new sketch. The kids can do 2D mirrors just as much as they can do single mirrors. So I can either do it as 2D or I can do it as 3D. And that's going to be two inches. It's going to put that dimension in there at 0.5, and that's already taken care of the other end for me anyways. So I can go ahead and mirror this cut down to the other end, and it's doing all that for me. I know they're all level. My kids, I force them to learn how to use all 12 of these. Um, collinear is one they use most often is to level things out or make things equal to each other. Oops. Um, I'm kind of glad it's doing this. The kids will get to this point and they're like, I can't pick what I want, I can't pick what I want, and they keep moving their mouths. I can't pick what I want, I can't pick what I want. I'm like, yeah, stop and hold on. If they pause for a second, this little guy will pop up and he'll tell you that you have more options there. I come here and it won't hold, and then I pause and I hold for a second, and I come in, I'm like, yeah, it can't pick anything because you won't hold still for a minute. Nice part about these chamfers is it's all the exact same chamfer all the way around. Because it tells me chamfer is one inch each side, so I come into here, 45 degree, one inch, and I can go ahead and I can click on all of them if they truly understand. Most of them understand the fillet tool pretty well, but a lot of them get hung up with how to use chamfer. When I make one of these slots, the newer version, I don't know what version of Inventor most of you are running, but if you're running the new version, you actually have a slot tool. I run in 2013, and 2013 doesn't have the slot. So you just draw it with rectangles and arcs. So it tells you that's a radius 0.375 and so on. You put all that on there and whatnot. Oops, diameter 0.375. Once I get this down to the other end, I'm not going to put on it, but I'll use that exact same tool I showed you at the beginning. And I'll cut that all. I'll do my work plane. And I'll mirror that down to the other end. Okay. The one that will trick most kids up is this one because they don't realize that this is a metric file. So they'll start it up and they'll start typing. I'm like, really, did you think that that was 46 inches and this was 100 inches across? This is a fairly large part. I'm not quite sure what it goes to, but at 100 inches is fairly big. So then they have to complete these. They're like, well, can I convert it? Uh, no. Uh, there is a way, but I'm not going to show them how to do it. They have to go ahead and just redraw it in that file. And when they start the new file, Unless you may notice when I've been going to start my new, um, and I can, I can give you the notes on this, I've made my own tab. I have a PLTW tab, and I got rid of all the stuff I didn't want the kids to use. Um, they get caught up when they come into here. They'll start mold designs and weld mats. They'll start sheet metals when they really wanted standard files. Um, they'll pick all kinds of stuff that I really don't need them in. So when I create my own, I narrow everything down, and I've made my own title blocks. Anyways. Um, each one of my title blocks, the kids fill these questions out, and it comes up this way. And I can give you this title block. 
you can get rid of the PLTW icon. You can put your school icon down here. You can do whatever you want there. But most of your kids, when they go to new, especially for this file, they will have to finally go to the metric tab, and they'll have to start a standard MMIPT. And they start modeling it all up. You've got fillets there. Um, I've got a chamfer there. I've got part of a slot here. Um, they do get kind of hung up on this one just a little bit just because of their strategy. Chris, I use Inventor a lot too, and one thing I noticed that the kids, I use um, the planes to, to offset everything, uh -huh. and um, they leave the planes on. So maybe people that haven't used it before, could you show them how to hide that plane? Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I know so, that's something that's hard sometimes for the kids to understand. And I know why Inventor does it. Right now I'm over the plane. I just can't pick anything. You can only pick planes when you're on the edge. If you could pick it all over the place, then I would have a hard time not picking it. Um, the planes will auto size. However big the part is, the plane will always be, um, I don't know, what's an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, something like that. It's always that much bigger than the part. Um, so if I grab you know, a plane from there, it'll, it'll be whatever size it was from whatever I clicked on. But to turn them off, um, you can do it in two ways. You can either just highlight it here and turn off its visibility, make it go away, or you can grab it from your browser bar and come over here and you can turn off its visibility. And I will tell you, I don't know why the students do this, but a ton, they turn this thing off. Uh -huh. Like, oh, something happened, it's gone. Yeah, you closed it. That's the only way that it can disappear. And you have to show them how to bring it back. So I want to show you how to bring it back. Um, in the View tab, you have the user interface. And in the user interface is that browser that they're turning off. Uh, there's times where they'll turn off the view cube. There's times when they'll turn off the navigation bar. I don't know why. They'll click that little box and they'll make him go away. And they're like, well, I, I don't have those tools anymore. Yeah, that's because you closed it out. Somebody else must have been. Well, no, Inventor is specific per user. So every user that logs onto the computer, Inventor will be just for them. So if they change the background or anything like that, they're not changing it for everybody. They're only changing it for themselves. So we have all four of these on the website. So if you have a kid that's really struggling, um, you can send them to the website. And there's no voice to it. Um, that way you don't have to listen to this voice echoing around the room. It sounds like me. Um, you can just have them kind of walk through the part. And it walks through at a, a decent pace. Um, even if they're watching it, they can still get it done pretty quickly. 